Y'all show Liz Ghetto. Allegedly. Check on your people show. It's your girl, Ron Judy, and today we have attorney Ron Haley. What's happening, Judy? I'm doing good. How you doing? Can't complain. Let's get into it. Can you take us back to your childhood and how you grew up and where? <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, that's a story within itself. Um, even though I claim to be a Louisiana boy, I was actually born in Shawnee Mission, Kansas. Okay. Uh, my biological father was in air traffic control school, and that's kind of where we were stationed at. Uh, but I didn't stay there long. I think we stayed there maybe nine months. I don't remember nothing about that. Um, after we moved to New Orleans for a little bit and my dad got into the Army and I became an Army brat for the next, I guess, three, four years of my life. I lived in Oklahoma. I've lived in Atlanta and I lived in Germany. Mm-hmm. Um, when my mom and dad split, I came back to New Orleans. And then when my mom remarried, we moved uh, to Baton Rouge. And I've been there until I was 18. Yes. <laughs> then at 18, went back to New Orleans to Xavier. Uh, I thought I was to be a doctor. Uh, I was taking those biology and chemistry classes and realized I really hated them. But I'd rather, you know, do my political science and my English classes. I think what really jumped out at me uh, when I knew it wasn't for me was during the 2000 presidential election. I was absolutely fascinated by the Bush v. Gore decision. I didn't like the decision, but just the... The, the legal arguments that went along with it. And so like every day after class, like I'm sitting in front of the TV, like it's, you know, P-Valley or <laughs> like on 24 seven. And we just, and just looking and looking at my friends that were all trying to uh, be doctors. They would come in talking about their labs. They would come in talking about what happened in the science class. They were all into that. And I was like, man, I'm into this. Uh, then one day I was in one of my English classes and the professor assign some type of oral argument assignment and so we did it and i gave some closing argument on something i can't remember what it was but i wound up getting a standing ovation from my class after it was over and i remember professor um michael jackson uh no relation to the to the michael jackson that, that we know here um professor jackson pulled me aside and said man what's your major i said biology pre-med he said man now you need to go to law school I said, man, look, I came to Xavier. If I was going to go to law school, you know, I went somewhere else. I'm going to stick it out. And he told me a story that his folks wanted him to be a CPA. And he got all the way through the CPA school, about to take the exam and realized that he didn't like it. He didn't like the shit. <laughs> I, I curse on him, right, Johnny? He didn't like the shit. And he wanted to do something else. And he said he wishes he would have, like, followed that dream because it delayed what he believed that his ultimate talent was. And that resonated with me. So the next semester, I changed my major. Didn't tell my parents until like I was halfway through the semester. I was like, hey, by the way, like the med school dream, nah, we ain't gonna do it. Uh, we're gonna do something else. Um, both of them were, you know, disappointed at the time. And you think to yourself, damn, you know what? Like, I'm not dropping out of school, <laughs> and not dropping out of med school and doing nothing. Yeah. Like, I'm just switching <laughs> from wanting to be a, a doctor to a lawyer. Um, you know, but I did. Uh, did you receive an undergraduate degree? I did. I finished my undergraduate degree. I switched from biology pre-med to political science. I received my BA in political science uh, in 2003 from Xavier. Uh, after that, I went to LSU Law School, uh, where I received both a JD and a bachelor's in civil law in 2006. Passed the bar in 2007, hung my own shingle, and God willing, it is still hanging up there to this day. Can we talk about you being class vice president over three times? <laughs> oh, my <laughs> Lord. <laughs> Man, you going all the way back. You going all the way back. So listen, um, that is a that is a funny story. Um, so my freshman year of college, you really did some digging, damn it. <laughs> so my freshman year of uh, of college, man, it was uh, me, uh, my best friend Stephen Jones, who's a doctor. Shout out to Urgent Care Eleven in New Orleans. He has like eleven like clinics out there and he has he's in all the charter schools so if you're in a charter school in New Orleans you wow. listen to this you're getting good health care because that's my dog um, and our boy Paul Atkins we were just sitting around like man what are we going to do our freshman year Paul is like I'm going to run for president Steve is like I'm going to run for Mr. Freshman I was like shit I'm going to run for for class vice president and we wound up all winning 
Um, and then the next year, we ran again un unopposed and just, I, you know, stayed involved in student government uh, my entire four years in undergrad. Wow, that's, that's great. And I see you for that, Kappa. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Yo, noobs, shout out to the noobs out there. KSI, final pie to the day I die. Is it true that you gotta like get beat up the joint? <laughs> Look, hey, we don't talk about hazing, <laughs> hazing. <laughs> We don't talk about hazing. Hazing. I don't know what you're talking about. And you was elected president of the LSU DLSA? Yes, I was. Can you tell me about that? No. Um, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my second semester of law school, I ran uh, for president of the Black Law Student Association. One of the things that I we didn't realize at the time uh and the acronym for it is balsa right that how big the organization was i just thought it was kind of like a you know the black student union at lsu like it's kind of like the group for like black law students right that that was really kind of all that we did but as i dig into it i realized that the black law student association is actually the largest run student only organization in north america and you're like wait how was the group of black law students the largest student run organization in in north america when we say student run, we mean completely student run. Like we have advisors, but we have our own checking accounts. Like there is no um, non-law student that has, I guess, reign over us. That makes sense. We have folks that'll be like, look, you might want to do this. You might not want to do that, but ultimately it is all student run. So if we want to go and there's, you know, $15,000 in, in the checking account and throw a $14,999 party, we could do that without asking for any type of, um, assistance or approval yes. we wouldn't do that but i'm saying it was really free reign so i ran there and, and i won so as i'm getting stuff from the national board again i didn't realize how big the organization was at the time i saw that the regional convention was in new orleans that next year so i made it my business to kind of galvanize like all the black law student chapters in louisiana and make sure we represented deep at that convention while at the convention i decided that listen i was going to run for regional chairperson um, being regional chair meant that I would be over all the Boston chapters from Louisiana all the way to North Carolina and everything in, in between around that southern eastern border. So I wound up being over maybe 11 states worth of law, black law students. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was an experience. It made my uh, law school times a, a lot of fun, but it was good hard work. And back in June, I seen that you received the, you had the honor of receiving the Broken Galvin Award. Yes. How was that for you? Man, it felt great. It, it wasn't just receiving the award that was great. It was who gave me the award that made it all special. Um, Robert and Fox Richardson and their and their kids are like family uh, to me, and I'm like family to them. I've been knowing them for the past eight years. I was hired in 2014 or 15, I think, um, to represent the Richardson family. Rob Richardson, who is an incredible man, like that's like my big brother. He was arrested, I think, in 1996 for armed robbery. The backstory to it is this. They were opening a consignment shop near Grambling. All the investors pulled out of it, and in the fit of desperation, he and the cousin robbed a, a credit union. Nobody was shot, nobody was beat. Not minimizing what it is, yes. but in the grand scheme of what armed robbery what could, could be, what it could have been. It, it wasn't that. So they go on a run, quickly apprehended, they arrested, they put some property up, they bond them out. They hire a lawyer. The lawyer got them a plea deal. Plea deal, I think, was anywhere between 10 to 14 years. Don't marry me on, on that. I was in high school when it happened. So they're in court, they're ready to take the plea deal. And at the time, you had to serve, I think, 50% of that time back in the early 90s, that it wasn't 85%, 75% day for day. So you're looking at it being kind of half of what that is. Another attorney came up to them who was older, uh, who was white, and was like, hey man, that that young black lawyer who got you that deal, don't know what you're talking about. Wait, you said that so many times. He was white. <laughs> Not trying to... Listen, and this really isn't, for me, I think my generation of lawyers have had it a lot easier than those whose shoulders we stand on. That it it's not everything is equal, but we're on probably more equal grounds now, mm -hmm. at least in as terms of being contemporaries in the legal field than it's ever been in history. And so 
just ask any lawyer that was practicing from the 70s all the way into the really the early to early mid 90s and you could probably take it into the early 2000s of what what it was like it was like a completely different world than what we're dealing with here and so the thought process was for a lot of us during that time was that listen white was right that they could get deals that we couldn't get and if just because of the color of their skin and we oftentimes fed fed into that and sometimes that would be true depending upon where you're at right so it's not the it, it may not be the most ethical thing to say but that's some of the things that were going on and so this guy based on his experience he had some age on on the lawyer yeah. that they had um you know he was in and around the courtroom it's like listen you give me x amount of dollars i'll make sure you get a better deal than this the better deal didn't happen and a week or two before trial this lawyer asked for another ten thousand dollars they didn't have the other ten thousand dollars and so the judge lobbied withdraw from the case it gets crazier they go to they go to trial with the public defender who only had two to three weeks to prepare they're they're sitting there and someone recognizes someone from the jury out of a fit of desperation back channels reach out to the jury member somehow the district attorney's office found out i'm not advocating tampering with juries but that happened judge got mad trial got uh was a mistrial and they retried the case later on during the retrial he was found guilty now the original offer was somewhere in the neighborhood between 10 to 14 this judge for a first time offender gave him 61 years oh. 60 years on the armed robbery and one year on the jury tampering and he ran them consecutive and the reason why he ran it consecutive was this it was 16 61 years to the day i don't know if to the day was 61 years before the last jury tampering case and that if he was alive at the 60th year and he had to do that last year he wants to remember that you don't fuck with juries in louisiana and so that led to the fight his wife wound up i think getting convicted of either jury tampering or obstruction of justice and they gave her time however at the time that this went down she was pregnant with twins and so what makes this story uh, amazing and you could follow the entire story their story uh of the movie is called time it's a documentary that is on amazon it was nominated for academy award it was uh a golden globe winner i'm gonna have to go look that up i'm in it not for a lot but <laughs> <laughs> i got about four to four to five seconds on it but you can see my face <laughs> And I'm in the credits, so like I was in an Academy Award nominated uh, documentary. I have that to my to my fame. But what makes their story just absolutely beautiful um, is that they had all boys, right? And she had to raise these boys by themselves. Now, Johnny, you know, you know this more than most that if you have one parent that has been incarcerated. The likelihood that you graduate high school is eh. mm. if you have both that have been incarcerated at any point in time it's like mm. eh. um to this date remy remington richardson is a dentist wow. malik is a smiley for those who don't know that he takes wine for a living and, <laughs> and, and rates wine for for a living you have uh, the twins, uh, one of which graduated Loyola School, uh, Loyola College, and I'm um, not Loyola College. Let me say it right, Loyola University, uh, and he is currently uh, working for Congressman uh, Troy Carter. Uh, you have their their youngest, uh, Robert Richardson Jr., uh, who is doing uh, amazing things in New Orleans. He is at at Newman, and I forget. Oh, Lawrence, can't forget about can't forget about Lawrence. He's on the same. They're all college educated kids. Uh, I'm sorry. They're all college-educated men. That's great. Uh, except for the 16-year-old who eventually will be a college-educated yes. uh, man. The fact that she's able to do this. So where did I come in at this? He's 20, almost 20 years into his sentence, and we wedged a fight to get geriatric parole in Louisiana. What that means is this: is that if you serve a prison sentence, if you serve a prison sentence, if you serve a prison sentence. Um, of 25 years or more 
and you reach the age of 45 and you've done 85% of what that time, regardless if you're up for parole or not, you can apply for parole eligibility. Now, parole eligibility versus parole consideration are two different things, right? Parole consideration has to do with where do you get parole at in your sentence, right? Do you get at 25%, do you get at 35%, do you get at 50%, yes. 60%, etc. Um, parole eligibility, um, I'm sorry, I said it the wrong way. Parole eligibility, forgive me, um, is connected to your sentence. So let's say if you have a nonviolent crime in Louisiana right now, and you get a 10 year sentence, you're eligible for parole at 25%. Parole consideration has nothing to do with your crime. Parole consideration has to do with your um, standing within DOC. It's almost like, um, I guess I would say like compassionate release or something like that. It's not quite compassionate release, but that has no, if you get a compassionate release, it has nothing to do with your sentence. It has something to do with where uh, you're fix, uh, situated within the Department of Corrections. And so we, we launched that fight. I know I'm rambling on this, but long story short, after about four, uh, about a four year fight uh, to get Robert out, uh, we finally got him granted uh, parole and he was released in 2018, I believe. That's wonderful. And uh, I mean, he's living this, they're living their best life. They're doing amazing things. Uh, they're over PD, uh, the participatory defense Enola. They're big in the criminal justice system. They're social advocates, warriors. Um, and, you know, that's my people. I love them. So to get an award by, from family, uh, hit a different way than, you know, just an organization. Not to say that there's no one we're getting it from an organization. <laughs> hey, can we also talk about you being part of the Ridge Collection Black Ball? Um, yes. So, love my dude, Gary. The ball's on the same day. The same day I had the participant, the PDM and NOLA and Broken Gavel Award was the same day Gary gave me this award. And when Gary offered me the award and I accepted, I didn't know it was the same weekend. And so I'm, it's like a, a week going into it. I was like, okay, when is the stuff for Fox and Rob? When is the stuff for Gary? And it was on the same day. It's like, what are the times? Is there a chance I can make both? Right. And I couldn't. And I felt absolutely awful because, man, Gary's awesome. We're supporting him for his bid for U.S. Senate. I think he's bringing a different energy. I think he's adding so much more to the to the conversation. And, you know, this idea that Louisiana is this, you know, ruby red state that can't get into progressive politics uh, doesn't necessarily know what our history is. I mean, just in the 90s, you know, we had at one point a Democratic governor, two Democratic senators, and we had control of, of the state, uh, the state house. Mm. And just in a matter of a generation that is completely turned on its head. And the reason why we can't talk the same democratic talk that was taught in, in the 90s and in the early 2000s. And the reason why you've seen an eroding of the democratic base is because our conversation has stayed the same within the party and has not evolved. You know, say what you want about the, the Republicans and let's have friends that are Republicans. This is not to make this a absolutely political show, but you know, they have evolved more with the members of their party than I think in a, at a faster rate than the Democrats have. When the, when their party became more evangelical, regardless if it's faux pas and <laughs> evangelicalism and it's not genuine, some people don't think it is. I'm not here to say, you know, somebody's belief in God is greater than somebody else's. Right. But when they saw that that was the shift of that party, they doubled down on that. When the Democrats saw that their party was being progressive and more liberal like liberalism became like such a bad word you know the opposite of conservative is liberal but conservatives double down on being conservatives and but for a long time democrats did not double down they shied away from being labeled a liberal democrat like that was something bad well hell man if you're not talking my language and you're not reaching me you're not going to be able to move me right and that has been the problem and so we're playing a generation of catch-up and Gary, what I love what he's doing is that he is, you know, on his own. His, his, I'm not saying it's a one man mission because he says that it is uh, not about me. It's about us. And he is creating a conversation and I think in a safe space statewide for progressive Democrats um, to be heard. And if, if nothing else he does, if he doesn't win, he is expanding that conversation and really expanding the democratic thought process that you're going to have to deal with progressives within the parties. 
Yes. And I seen you partner with Fairfax Initiative. Can you tell me more about that? Well, this is in direct response to the abortion litigation um, that was taking place around the country. When the Dobbs decision came down, basically states that had abortion trigger bans, Louisiana being one of them, immediately went into effect. Um, this put women's health at absolute risk. I don't think a man should be able to tell a woman what to do with their body. And I damn sure don't think a government should be able to tell a woman what to do with their body. I um, definitely agree with that. And so we have seen pushback from this ban. And so what me and the Fair Fight Initiative and the lawyers that have joined with us are basically said, listen, if you're a woman, if you're a health care provider, if you're someone that helps a woman, because the way the law is written, maybe if you give somebody a ticket to fly out of town to go see about an abortion, is that is that considered aiding someone to have an abortion? Like the way it's written, it's, it's very vague. Um, but that if you get in trouble, if you're arrested for for that, we would represent you for free. Yes. And so that if you're not going to a- allow a um, conservative leaning Supreme Court strip your rights and you are still going to exercise your rights as a woman to protect one's body, um, to protect one's health, to protect one's spirituality, to pr- just protect being a woman. And for those who get in trouble for helping that cause and they need a lawyer, call us and we're not going to charge you. Y'all heard that? Call them free. I want to get into the Contavious Anderson case. Can you let us in a little bit? So we're still in the fact-finding stages as to what happened. We issued public records request. Um, we have heard from the attorneys representing the sheriff's department. They asked for, as of the date that we shot this, they asked for additional time to get us that information, which isn't out of the ordinary. So I don't want to, you know, yes. throw them under the bus and say, oh, they hired their lawyers to they delay, delay, their delay. They, they responded. They're doing their job. Now, if I don't get it in four or five months, then I come back here and be like, look, something must be up. But as of now, you know, they're doing their job and their responses. So with Contavious, Contavious was arrested on a bench warrant for a court, a misdemeanor court date that he missed in June of 2022. So he was arrested on a Thursday. All right. And so for those who don't know um, that if you're arrested on a Thursday, there's a chance that you might be sitting on the weekend, depending upon, yeah. depending upon um, if you may call out or not. He did not make call out. So it was set just to clear a bench warrant, a misdemeanor warrant, not minimizing what it is, but this is not a arrest warrant for his arrest yeah. or some new criminal activity. Uh, and looking at his record, he had not missed a bunch of court dates. Um, he had made the ones previous, so this isn't somebody that was habitually missing court. All likelihood, the judge would recall his warrant. I know that's the case because when he finally got him to court, guess what? The judge recalled the warrant without any action against him. So he was set to go to court Monday. He did not make the docket to see the judge Monday. According to uh, what was given to the judge, they said that he was on, he had COVID and he was on a COVID line. So they reset it for two weeks. His grandmother called up there and they told her, no, he's not, a quarant- he's not on the COVID line. He is on the quarantine, not quarantine line. He's on the detox line. No history whatsoever of any type of substance abuse that he, that he needed to be on some type of detox line. And so something seemed very suspicious. wrong and, right. and suspicious. Then the family started getting anonymous calls from within inside the jail saying that, nah, they jumped on him um, pretty good in there. And they're just trying to delay the fact uh, so he could heal up. Well, um, before he had a chance to heal up, they jumped on him again. And so he finally was released from custody. I believe on August the 2nd of, of this year, um, maybe in a few days before, but when he came out, he came to my office and his injuries were, were horrific. The fact that he was in jail for that long after he was jumped on and beat up and he still had the, the scar marks, he still had the bruisings, he still had, um, you know, quasi open wounds. Let's let us know that, um, something happened to him. We received some initial reports uh, from from there that highlighted an incident that that took mm-hmm. place within central booking um, and then another one on the queue line so we asked for the cameras there um, we're waiting to hear the, the results but it appears that to make layman's terms they beat the hell out of this guy mm-hmm. over the weekend and didn't bring him to court because they didn't want the judge to see him jacked up mm-hmm. Okay, can we also talk about the fight with Dean and DHA for the senior citizens of Louisiana? Yeah, so during Hurricane Ida, listen, everybody hurt, saw the stuff. With the senior citizens yes. just basically dumped 
into um, these warehouses that were not equipped to house them. Many people died uh, at the time, and I think some of the deaths that happened subsequent to that, shortly after in, in the in the weeks and months that took place, that the, it took a physical toll out on a lot of these, um, you know, these the elderly, which next to children, you know, they are need to be the most protected within this community. Yes. We need to protect those that cannot protect themselves. And so we took on the fight against Bob Dean to sue on behalf of these individuals uh, to bring him to justice because what it seemed that he was doing, he was running these uh, nursing homes like he was a slumlord. And listen, we're going to give you the bare minimum even when it comes to evacuation. We're going to give the bare minimum and just hope for the best. And in this case, it, it wound, up, wound up being the absolute worst that caused people uh, lives and this caused mental scars is going to live with the the elderly um, that or that survive for the rest of their lives. Yes, my grandma was in the. No, nah, man, that shit was horrible. Like I ain't like I'm not even lying. It's like listening to look, looking into that, um, you know, he needs to be brought to justice. And listen, you know, by putting the political pressure on them, by coming out and filing a strong lawsuit, and to keeping attention in the in the news, that led to his eventual arrest. He was arrested in Livingston Parish and had to make bond, and he will see his day in court. And so we're not only going to try to get financial and monetary justice yes. for our clients, uh, we are going to seek that he is prosecuted for what he did. Because by running his... Holding him accountable. Uh, holding him accountable, not just with his pockets, but with his freedom. Okay, and can we talk about the Department of Justice? So, yeah, so one of the, again, another victory that we have, shouts out to the NAACP uh, and the Social Justice Committee. Uh, based on the statewide lawsuits that we have against the Louisiana State Police Department. Um, I can't get into all of them based on uh, certain restrictions I have from federal court, but in general, based on the pressure that we put on them and the attention yes. that we placed on them, the Department of Justice has come in and opened what's called a Patterns of Practice Investigation. For everybody out there that doesn't know what that means, basically looking to see if you have a fucked up culture. Okay. All right. And if they say, see that it, the culture's messed up and then there's similarities to how it is, such as is there's a pattern in the way people are beaten is there a pattern in the way certain people are targeted for arrest is there a pattern with losing evidence and i'm not saying they have all this but they're going to do a deep dive within there then they're going to issue a report and potentially they can fall what's called with under consent decree which means the state police won't be able to run itself by itself they would have the federal government as an oversight yes. it's not the perfect thing but it's some of the strongest things that can be done because of our work i believe that we would have changed um not only in the short term but in for the foreseeable future what policing looks like within the state police. Um, how historic this is, this is only the second statewide agency that's been under a patterns and practice investigation in the past 25 years. The only, the only other state was New Jersey State uh, Police Department. And can we talk about the giveaway I had at Idea Bridge? Y'all doing that again <laughs> for Christmas? Oh, I'm going to be right out there, man. I'm going to be there. Be Santa's helper. What made Jean Santa Claus? There ain't nobody taking Santa Claus from Jean. Who did y'all partner with with Sunday? Oh, we, we partnered with uh, Cleve Dunn, members of the city council, um, different organizations. So this is just this was a, a community effort to come back and give to the community. So how do y'all come up with these ideas? Like y'all just have a meeting and say we gonna give back? Pretty much Christmas, Easter. Pretty much we get together like, what are we gonna do for the community? We always got to give back, okay. one way or the other. If it's, you know, if, if it's not with gifts. It's with their time. Uh, there are many ways. You don't have to necessarily put a dollar in somebody's pocket everything to get back. Everything ain't monetary. No, everything's not monetary at all. So let's get into the DCFS situation with the little kid, Mitchell Robinson. Listen, baby Mitch is probably one of the most difficult cases that we've taken on from like an emotional standpoint. Uh, and that's saying a lot. But the fact that a two-year-old baby um, had basically overdosed not once not twice three times before and there wasn't even any intervention the last time and and the last time was his last time uh, because he succumbed to fentanyl overdose his mother obviously was suffering from the disease of addiction uh folks that suffer from the disease of addiction are victims as well yeah. and and um, because they can't help themselves listen you look back in the 1980s during the crack epidemic all it was like hey you know what you know you hooked on crack after it throw you in jail uh, for a long time and, and, and throw away the key. We see where that got us, right? That, that set another generation of folks back uh, because of not treating the disease, but treating uh, addicts as criminals. 
Uh, the shift has been uh, for those faced with the opioid crisis that, hey, we need to look at this situation differently than what we did crack in the, in the late 80s and in the early 90s. And so I, I look at, you know, his mother as, listen, this was cries for help that, you know, it, it's called DCFS for a reason, Department of Children and Family Services. Where were the child they, services? Where were the family services? Why can we get this woman help? Uh, why can we intervene and, and temporarily place this child with a with another family member while the mother got herself together? While the mother learned um, to be a sober, sober human being, but that didn't happen. And and the tragedy is is that due to I believe departmental management uh, from the top from the top that trickled down is really what failed them. And the frontline workers it's a thankless job for a lot of them. Uh, they are underpaid, understaffed, undertrained to deal with this. And, and that's why you see across the board um, variations in the way DCFS comes down. Listen, for every, you know, severe case, tragic case like, like Mitchell Robinson, I've heard a horror story where the smallest thing has happened and DCFS comes down with the strong hammer of the law. And it's like, oh my gosh, we have, you know, a legitimate accident that's took place yes. that doesn't result in loss of life or or an uh, injury on the playground. I don't mean to cut you off, but they too busy watching on the TV stamps. And they are paying attention to the stuff that needs to be paid I, I agree. So many kids is dying. Just like the little boy, I want to say in Homer, the little boy who mom put him in the trash can, they, they reported so many cases of it, and it took for this baby to die, if y'all realize. Right, and, and so it's not, there's no consistency across the board on how they regulate uh, and how each individual case is, is handled. Yeah. Um, you know, for every tragedy there is, I mean, you would hear like the food stamp case, like why are y'all on me for food stamps? Maybe you face this, you take, excuse me, that energy and focus on the things that, yes, that matter. Yes, yes. And not to say that you shouldn't look into, you know, that helps with the budget and everything, but <laughs> come on now, you know, let, let's not, you know, lay the smack down yes. on, on some food stamps <laughs> yeah. when, when we have real abuse going on in homes and that needs to be addressed. Yes. That's hit close to home though, cause we call him Dude Mitchell, so that's like my baby cousin. And it's those two. So, what are some things that people misconstrued about Lauren Haley? I just like to be on TV, which is crazy, cause I'm saying that shit on <laughs> <laughs> on a media outlet. Um, but that's what it's about. But listen, it's. I don't jump on television just to jump on television. I jump on television because it's a cause that's worth it. I jump on television because it's a client that, that needs it, that, that needs that level of advocacy. And listen, pressure in the news works. It helps to make change. And I'm in the business of not only helping my individual clients, but making system changes. Listen, I could stand on the work that I've done myself and my work that I've done with my, my partners at my firm and other law firms that have worked with this, and especially the NAACP and the ACLU, that we have made some real significant system changes in this community over the past three years. Because of the work and the pressure we put on, we have completely dismantled the Narcotics Division of the Baton Rouge Police Department. Yes. So many people were free. So many charges got dropped. Because of the pressure that we put on on individual cases against the state police, the state police has a patterns and practice investigation by the Department of Justice, one that has not happened in the past 20 to 25 years. Because of the pressure that we're going to put on DCFS and we're going to put the pressure and we're going to get legislation that in baby Mitch's name to make sure that this baby's death is not just an earmark that happened in 2022, mm -hmm. that who is he? He is just this baby that died of fentanyl. No, there's going to be laws that are put in place to protect babies, that there's not another baby Mitch that, that took place. And I'm passionate about those things. And listen, it's and the other thing is because of the attention that some of the cases that I have on, I think it leads to sometimes unrealistic expectations of what I could do. Uh, I'm not lawyer Jesus. I don't walk. <laughs> I, I, I don't walk on water. I'm imperfect, uh, but I, I do try and I do care. That's great. I, you, you, Am I? A good person. Yeah. So can you tell me like things that you have going for 2022? Any other goals, partnership? Um, I just, I just want to be in the gaps that when injustice happens, that we can go there and try to solve it. Are we going to be able to get everything? No. Are we be able to solve everything? No. But what I want to know and let the folks know that this is a safe place 
where where you can come that if it's not contact contacting my office directly contact the social justice committee at the NAACP I'm on that social justice committee at the NAACP there are other lawyers that are on there if you don't want to deal with me but there are avenues that if you see injustice out there that if it's from a actual legal representation standpoint or just using our collective platforms to advocate for a particular position or cause uh, you know we're down to do that and a lot of the work we don't charge for when it comes to the advocacy work and so if something goes wrong and you think you don't have a dollar to put towards that fight, man, come holler at us. Maybe we can help you out with that. So, like, anybody in the community could call and, like, put their input in on the situation that's going on? We, we need, com- listen, we need community input on all of this stuff, right? If we, it's not enough to tear down these institutions, yes. right? It's not enough that the state police is under patterns of practice investigation. The state police will not change if the community does not come forward. There's hotlines that the DOJ is set up. Communicate with the Department of Justice. Man, if there are things you see in the community by the state police that's not right, call them. The only way it's going to change is that, that we know. All right? Same thing with DCFS. Listen, if there are things out there that you just know that aren't right or you think that aren't right, call us. Let us know because it's not enough to tear these things down. We need to be in the process of rebuilding these things up. Yes. Can we talk about... Wait, I want to know, do people like think you like a rat or work with the police sometimes? Do they ever misconstrued it? <laughs> I'll say this. Um, Google me. Right. And, 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 and figure that out. Uh, I, that is... Okay. Ain't taking down the Bamberg's Police Narcotics Division. <laughs> I'm not taking down... Helping to take down the Louisiana State Police. Uh, I'm not helping to take down some of these institutions. Hell, by the time you uh, this airs, listen, this Friday, you know, we're going to have a press conference where we're going to try to prevent our babies from going to Angola uh, and, and awaiting their juvenile sentences. Um, I'm in the business of fighting institutions. Can't do that. Right. right. <laughs> I was just asking, because you know a lot of people don't got schools. Man, right? listen, if, if that was the case, I would have been clipped off at the knees a long time ago. <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't get clipped off at the knees. They but, try. Okay. okay, can we move forward to you being part of the NAACP Social Justice Team? Listen, uh, the NAACP Social Justice Initiative um, Committee uh, is the premier, um, I believe, you know, civil rights arm uh, throughout the state. You know, the work that we have done collectively together, myself with Eugene Collins, Elena Bloodworth, Tierra, I mean, I could go on and on. I investigate as a guy, brother Domino, in this thing right now, right? You know, we are um, in the business of right. I think Eugene said it best at our uh, most recent meeting. We're in the business of not just black folks' business. We're not in the business of brown folks or white folks or green folks or red folks or Republicans or Democrats, Catholic, Baptist, atheist, whatever. We're in the business of making wrong right. And if you want to be in the business of making wrong right, come holler at us. And again, we have such a big tent. It's not about me. It's not about Eugene. It's not about Johnny. Look, if you you know don't have a taste for me, there's somebody within the within the group you have a taste for. If, you, if Johnny isn't your, your speed, there's somebody in there that that may be your speed. But if in your heart you're in the business of making wrong right, this is the place to be. And so- I'm proud to be a part of them. So what resources could y'all use to push us to make this fight stronger? You, Judy. Okay. You. I'm already part like of no. I mean, but it's keep on elevating the issue to understand that this tent isn't a tent for lawyers. It isn't a tent for the educated. It is not a tent for uh, those who are seeking political power or influence. This is legitimately a tent to right wrongs. Yes. Listen, I may be the lawyer that people see on television and in the courtroom. But I've made G-Rides with Eugene. I've made G-Rides with Johnny Domino. Going to investigate these things myself. Taking the suit and tie off and doing the dirty work. Right? And that's not to big me up. And I'm saying everybody in there has a role. So this is not about, oh, I have to be at this level or that level. I have to be this age or that age. Legit, if you're in the business of seeing a wrong and making it right, this is the place to be. And there's enough of us where you could find your cup of tea. Whether you want it sweet or unsweet, whether you want an Arnold Palmer or you want some lemonade, man, shit, we got like we got you there. Okay, so who can we get in contact with for if we see a wrong? 
who can we call in the NAACP? Get on to call Gene and be like, Gene Collins, I just saw such and such. I don't know what call it is. Call him, Instagram, hit getaways up. Look. <laughs> <laughs> and y'all doing crazy how within the community of putting it on and just put your phones up and, and, and chat and tag Domino and he'll put you in the right place. Uh, and so it was real easy, you know, whether it's contacting my office, if you're shooting an email, like it don't matter. We get the message on. We talk all the time. Uh, there's not a day that myself and Johnny and, and Eugene don't talk four times a day. We ain't talking about once a day, four or five times a day. If it's not calls or text messages about what's going on in the community, what we could do to, to right these wrongs. Um, oftentimes it's a thankless job, but it's a job that needs to be done. Yeah, you're right. And there's no other place I'd rather be, despite the negatives that come with it. So is there anything else that you would like to say or let the folks know? That we're here. That, you know, we need you. We need you. And it's not about business. This is, again, this is, the, no, it is about business. This is business and righting wrongs, yeah. right? And so if you see something, say something. And it's not about being a rat, oh, I saw this person doing this or that. Um, but if we don't know, we can't help. Also, when there are issues that we're advocating on, that is important to you. I'm not saying everything that we do, you have to agree with. But like I said, if it's a women's rights issue, and that's something that's very important to you, Judy, Judy, come on. Yeah. Like, like, come on. Come march with us. Come be at the press conference. Um, come to my office. Share what your experiences are. Let us know what we can do to help elevate that issue for you. Come and, come and join the fight. If it's an issue that, listen, man, I'm a, I'm a mother uh, in, in the community, and my son or, or daughter has been kind of in and out the system, and the fact that now they're talking about shipping our kids to, An to Angola, depending on if they meet a certain classification, because the, the systems that are in place to keep them there are woefully short and, and there's all kind of failures that are leading to uh, these escapes but the, the the solution is not to fix the problem it's like you know what we're gonna make that Angola's problem yeah. right now if that's near and dear to you man holla at us tell us why you're scared join the fight come to the press conferences come to the marches um, we just want the community to be involved because this could be a special thing the partnership with the NAACP and getaways and and lawyers and movers and shakers in the in the community that are in the business of right. We can't do it without the community. I would say, I'll put it even better way, Judy. It's not enough to be a keyboard activist. Yeah, we appreciate the likes. Yeah, we appreciate some of the comments. Yeah, we appreciate the thumbs up and the hearts and the go get them. But we need to go get you. Yes. And so what I want is a bunch of go get you to come out here to join us so we could go get them. Because it's easy to say, oh, I don't think they should take away abortion. But to get out there and say it and let the people know, like, this is really how we feeling is a real difference. It I is. Just, I understand it. And listen, and, and for a situation like that, right, if you're not going to get out there and do it, it's to make it easier for to take those rights away. Yes. Okay. And so if you're talking about a particular situation, let's, let's use the um, DCFS case, for instance. If the community doesn't rally behind us, we're not going to change the DCFS. We're not. If you look at the Angola case, the Angola situation with the kids, if we don't rally as a, as a community to show like we actually give a damn about this, they're going to keep on messing over our, messing over our kids. If we don't rally behind police mis misconduct and, in, and injustices, and that they're not held to the same standard as us as citizens are, are held, and they should be held to the same standard as, as citizens they're going to keep on doing doing the same thing because without our collective voices it don't matter if, if johnny talking about that shit every damn day and get ten thousand likes it don't matter if i'm if i have 50 press conferences in, in a year if the people don't collectively come behind right yeah. and say that listen we're not going to stand for this then those that are in power will be like well look there's not enough people that want to try <laughs> and what we what we have learned at least in how and this is really unfortunate, and it goes on both sides of the aisle. It ain't just the name Republican thing. It's a Democrat thing, too. It's an independent thing, too. That politics are turned into, like, wrestling. Right? Freshman wrestling. That listen, and it's all about my side getting it up. It's not about what makes common sense. And, you know, you're allowed... Um, I will tell you this. If there were... If the people that, su that supported women's health care rights... Mm. And I think messaging is important, Right? You just say support abortion rights is like, oh, we're supporting killing babies. 
people who are in support of women's health care rights and women being able to have the freedom to make their own decisions yes. would have spoken up and been loud this entire time, this, in my opinion, wouldn't happen. But it didn't start getting loud, exactly. real loud, until after it was taken away. Yes. So folks on the other side of the political aisle is like, well, shit, the ones that, that do care about taking them away, they louder than them. So we're going to listen to them because they're the ones putting money in our pockets. They're the ones that are coming out to the polls yeah. to vote, in particular on those issues. And I think we got caught sleeping that, oh, man, the Supreme Court ain't never going to overchange it. Guess what? Enough of them got on there that they sure as hell changed it. Wow. So do you have any other information you want to put out there, like, for if people contact you for criminal defense, civil? Listen, you know, I'm easy to find. You know, my uh, number is 225-663-8869. Uh, you know, you can find me at rhaleylaw.com. Uh, my email address is rhaley at ronaldhaleylawfirm.com. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm accessible. And if you can't find me in those ways, call Johnny. And it also was a pleasure having you guys on the Check On Your People show here with your girl, Worm Judy, where we bring you the people that's for the people. Wow. Join the game. <laughs>